So the next speaker is uh, Professor Cassie Willis. And Cassie is uh, Castle Laventis Professor of Biodiversity in Zoology Department of Oxford. And she's also the director of the Biodiversity Institute in Zoology and uh, a fellow in Merton College, Oxford. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ping Ping. I have the unenviable task of giving the last talk, although it could, be, it could be seen as a good thing because I've heard everybody else's excellent talks and I can delete slides to go along. So, <coughs> if I was standing here in the 1980s or 1990s and I was going to talk to you about biodiversity conservation, I would have been talking to you predominantly about biodiversity prioritisation schemes, i.e. where to place the protected areas globally. So we had things like the biodiversity hotspots of Conservation International, who were, so this is very much on species richness and endemism. We also have landscapes, the World Wildlife Fund eco-regions, protecting the most important landscapes globally. And then we have the, uh, the things like the um, IUCN um, uh, priority areas, protected areas, and their threatened species. However, in the last 10 years, it's become increasingly apparent that these schemes are not working. Biodiversity declines continue in response to climate change and human impact. And what's also become apparent is how important biodiversity is for economic um, health and well-being, human well-being. So in 2005, there was the introduction of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Now this assessment totally changed the landscape of biodiversity conservation because it started to assess biodiversity in terms of its economic potential for human well-being. So it's not necessarily a monetary value, it's the, it's the value that that biodiversity pr provides for day-to-day -day living. So for example, it could be biodiverse landscapes, it could be pollinators which are important for pollinating the crops on that landscape. So this is the, uh, the well-shown well sort of Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Framework, where basically you have four ecosystem services, predominant ones in here. You have the supporting services, there's things like nutrient cycling in there. The provisioning services, so uh, food and crops and freshwater fuel. Regulating, so things like carbon drawdown would be a really important uh, ecosystem service. And then the cultural values, the aesthetic values you get from a landscape through, for example, sacred sites or even tourism. So just to, give, to, to emphasize that point further, so of course all of these then lead on to these important aspects for human well-being. So to take that one stage further, here is our, here is our typical landscape. This is actually, I'm not even sure where it is, actually I won't say where it is, but I don't know. Um, typical landscape. So normally, if we were going to do a biodiversity um, conservation protected area assessment, you'd be saying, well, where is the, the area of highest species richness on this landscape? But within an ecosystem service framework, you'd split it up as follows. At the bottom, this area here would be very important for provisioning for the growth of crops and various other, other um, features of that landscape. This patch here, though, is probably very important for your supporting services. So let's say that's an important area or an important habitat for your pollinators. The area of trees there is important for your regulating for your carbon drawdown. <coughs> and the mountains themselves and the landscapes they can represent are important for your cultural services. So it could be spiritual values or it could be your tourism. <coughs> Now, the important thing about the ecosystem service framework is when people have looked, there's a lot of points to this one for change. When people have looked, there's a lot of spatial concordance between global biodiversity hotspots and your ecosystem service value. So, here, at the, obviously, Amazon Basin or the Congo Basin, where you've got, we know we've got very, very high biodiversity in terms of your species richness, you've also, in April 2012, and it's an inter inter independent intergovernmental body. Uh, part of the United Nations IUCN uh, branch in that. And it's, the, it's this body for assessing the state of the planet's biodiversity, its ecosystems, and the essential services they provide to society. They had their first meeting two weeks ago. Not a single paleo person was at it, I hasten to add. So where are the knowledge gaps that they've, they've already identified in terms of uh, it first? So I've split it down here there into these different, slightly more easy to understand ecosystem services. So you've got your ecosystem processes in here, things like nutrient cycling, biomass, uh, primary productivity. 
You've got your final ecosystem services, so that would be things like crops, trees, water regulation. And then you've got the actual goods that you get from these ecosystem services, be them the timber or the cereal or the or clean water. Knowledge gaps then. Well, they recognise at least three. And the first knowledge gap is understanding how ecosystem processes vary in time and space. That's the first one that's been recognised. The second one is understanding how final ecosystem services are influenced by changes in ecosystem processes. So what is the link between this and this? How does a change in nutri nutrient cycling affect a change in, in, for example, your crop productivity? And then your third one that's been very much highlighted, it was highlighted at the beginning of this talk, at this whole conference as well, is understanding the factors that lead to sustainable supply of ecosystem services. I'd say there's a fourth knowledge gap though, and it's this, that in the 2005 Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the longest data set being used was 50 years. And I think that's a, really, that's a very serious problem when you're thinking about the major regulatory um, uh, uh, the, the things like the trees with their average turnover of 50 to 100 years, but also the major climatic variability. We've had fantastic talks about river basin changes and damming in the last couple of days as well, all highly relevant to this work and yet not being covered in any of this Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. So for the remainder of the talk, I just want to ask what paleo data, or how can paleo data contribute to this ecosystem service framework? And I've got, I've got three examples that I want to um, look at with various case studies. First of all, ecosystem processes, and then finally ecosystem services, and finally sustainability of ecosystem services through time. So let's start with the um, trends in biomass. This is my case study under ecosystem processes. And the key questions that really they need to know, and, and we all need to know in order to um, uh, manage for the future, what's the variability of land cover over time? And possibly more important, what's the variability of biomass over time? So we have a change in land cover, but unless we know the change in biomass, then we can't probably model, and we certainly, in terms of biomass, we can't model crops, uh, the amount of food we're going to get from crops. Now, originally, Pollen data has always been pushed to one side because we, well, you can't model land cover because basically you're looking at a pollen percentage diagram and different pollen types give out different amounts of pollen. <coughs> I say we used to say that because after the superb work by the Landklin group, um, we have various models now. These ones by Shinya Sugita, which were produced in uh, these papers published in 2007, where using our knowledge about present day distribution of vegetation, the pollen fall rates, and distribution of pollen across the landscape, you can convert your pollen, your pollen uh, data into a land cover um, representation. And that's, this has been very much work that's been supported by Pages and um, Mary, oh sorry, didn't want to touch that one. Uh, Mary uh, Jose Gallard has been leading this, this Holocene land cover reconstruction. I saw that Neil Roberts has got a very nice paper on this, um, a very nice poster on this in this conference. But there are also other models, I mustn't forget these. There's some very nice Bayesian modeling coming through from some American groups as well. So what does that mean then? Well, let's give you one example of how you can use this sort of data. And this is work done by Lindsay Gilson and, Chris, Lindsay Gilson and Christina Duffin, where they were looking at this whole question in relationship to management of the Kruger National Park. So in Kruger, you've got two sorts of land cover. You've got this sort of fairly woody savanna, and you've got this very open landscape. Now, the park managers don't like too much of this, and they think that this is due to grazing, overgrazing by the elephants. <laughs> And therefore, they want to bring in some management um, regime that once you get to a particular point where you have too, or you lose too much woody cover, you come in and you effectively cull the animals that you think are causing this. But the land managers also in Kruger work on a basis that you have natural variability in time in your vegetation. It's not a static vegetational picture. And so they set a management strategy where intervention will occur when woody cover has decreased by 80% of its highest ever value. So it sounds great, and then you say, well, what is the highest ever value? And of course, you don't know what the highest ever value is because nobody's looked backwards. So Lindsay, Gilson, and Christi excuse me, Christina went back and they used the land claim and the real model approach 
to reconstruct land cover over time for various sites in Kruger. So they collected some sediment cores from uh, various pans in the Kruger National Park. And then basically what, what you had to do to, to um, enable this, this, these models to work, they collected modern pollen data from surface samples and modern vegetation surveys. And basically you link these to, into an equation where you can then calculate what each pollen percentage type or pollen abundance type in your record represents in terms of land cover. So you've got your changes in your fossil pollen over time, your pollen vegetation relationship, and in here you come up with a measure of your paleo -wood woody vegetation cover. So if we look at this diagram here, so this is going from about one and a half thousand years ago to present, what you'll see is in fact that this is the woody vegetation cover, it's only ever been about 28% on this landscape, and it's not really changed, natural variability about here. This is 80% below its mean here, and it's never got anywhere near that. So especially towards the end, it's not necessary to bring in management to start culling elephants on that landscape. And this is very much being fed back into the Kruger National Park plan, that basically management intervention in these locations at present is not necessary. But that was only possible to do that by using the reconstructed information from your pollen records. But what about biomass? So you've got land cover, but what you really also want to know is about your overall biomass, particularly when you're thinking about carbon modelling. What does it really mean on the ground? And I think this is really nice work that's come out from Heike Saper's group. I know he's now on an aeroplane, so I can be rude about it, but I won't. I think it's extremely good work. Um, basically, he's been looking at how you can convert fossil pollen data into a measure of biomass. So this is the present-day spruce on the landscape in um, Fenoscandia, of um, Paisia Abbeys. And you'll see the dark patches here are, I think they're about 100, 100 metres cubed per hectare. So really, really high density of, of Paisia. As you go up, this up here is not, it's not to 9 metres per hectare of, of spruce, so much, much higher rates. The interesting thing is this table, though. So here... This is your modern pollen accumulation rate. So they took surface samples from across this landscape mm -hmm. and looked at the modern pollen. And then if you look at the modern biomass in here, what you find is that where you have very high pollen accumulation rates, you have high biomass. And where you have the low pollen accumulation rates, you get the very, very low biomass. And this has been demonstrated before, but I think this is the clearest evidence I've seen where you really can start to use your pollen accumulation rates to um, give you some indication of biomass. And this is what Hakey did in this, in this work, where, so this is the spruce, this is going from uh, 8,000 to, to present, and that the spruce is this darker yellow here. And as you can see, as it gets warmer and drier, you get a large increase in the biomass of spruce across this landscape. So what about the second one? Nutrient cycling is a really important one, a really important one. I've heard quite a lot of very good talks about this here as well. What's the relationship between nutrient cycling, climate change, and human impact? And the case study I want to give you here is to do a progressive nitrogen limitation hypothesis. So my understanding of nitrogen before I started reading around this is, I think I now realize it's quite naive. I just assumed that with nitrogen, with atmospheric deposition, that nitrogen was increasing and this was, this was a, a problem within the our soils. But in fact, the progressive nitrogen limitation hypothesis argues the other way. It suggests that as we increase, as atmospheric carbon dioxide increases, we have the systems are becoming depleted in nitrogen. Why is this happening? Well, first of all, there's an increase as you have more CO2, the plants are, are photosynthesizing more, become more productive, and as a result of that, you get increased plant uptake of nitrogen, and the nitrogen becomes fixed in the wood. So you've effectively taken out, out of your cycling system. The other one is you get, with increased CO2, you get an increased microbial carbon availability in the soils, and your microbes in the soils basically are working much harder, and that, that depletes the availability of nitrogen for higher plants. So what, what, how does paleo um, contribute to this? There was a very nice work done by Kendra McLaughlin and others on this, where they decided just to go back, they only went back to about 18, 1825, they looked at um, nitrogen as represented in delta-15N in um, tree ring 
tree with a second expensity trees, 850 samples in here. And what they showed is this is a decrease in your nitrogen availability to the trees through time since, since the, 18, uh, the early 1900s. So they were arguing from this paper that yes, indeed, you are starting to see a nitrogen limitation occurring across the landscape. Um, and they then looked at herbarium samples as well. This is in this new phytologist paper. However, what does it mean globally? Is this happening globally? Well, they've now this paper is about to come out on, in uh, Nature next week, I believe, where they looked at um, 86 records from across the world. And what they looked at was a nitrogen delta 15N in lake sediments to say, are we seeing a trend with climate and do we see a trend with human activity? And does it, does it play to the nitrogen limitation hypothesis or the increase in nitrification as a result of human activity? So this is the smooth data. This is thanks to Lizzie Jeffers that I've got this data. But effectively what it's showing is as you get warmer, increasing the atmospheric carbon dioxide in the early post-glacial, you do indeed see a big decrease in the availability of nitrogen. As more and more plants take the nitrogen up and it's becoming fixed in the wood. We then plateau out in the mid-Holocene, and then as we move towards the end of the Holocene, the last 500 years or so, we see the anthropogenic, or we see an increase in here in, in the last, yeah, last 500 years. But if you expand that last 500 years out, you'll see there's not a clear trend either way. And what they've concluded from this is that basically you've got this declining delta 15N in relation to increased CO2 concentrations and warming in the early post-glacial, but over the last 500 years, there's no, no globally consistent change in here. And that local conditions are most important. We can't say one way or the other. It depends on where you are as to whether it's a nitrogen limited or actually a nitrogen surplus system. I want to move on to this next one, the final ecosystem service. What can paleo data tell us about final, final ecosystem service provision? And for many, many economists, probably, and maybe uh, forest managers and people growing crops, the key thing they want to know is where's going to be the best region for them to plant their trees, their biofuels, whatever, in the next 50 years. And I think it's clearly a, a, a tricky, a very tricky question, and many people um, would step back from it, although I do know climate modelers that are working on this, so it's not just, uh, not just me. Um, but what do we do for vegetation? How do we look at vegetation response and where things will be going in the, in the next 50 years, 50 to 70 years? Well, the models that are most often used are the species distribution models. So these are based on present day distribution of species in relationship to its present day climate envelope. And effectively, you overlay the two, and then you predict the climate in the future, and you predict where that species on, where the, the species <coughs> envelope will be um, in the future. Well, so this is a, a classic example. This is the song thrush, and so this is using this species distribution model. Here's, and this is uh, 2050, this is 2070 here. So the areas with red will lose the song thrush, the areas with blue will gain, and the areas with green, the turquoise, the green colour, will stay about the same. Now, as you can imagine, for a, for a policymaker, this is a fantastic map. That's exactly what they want. They want to see this sort of thing. But of course, as any modeller in this room will sit there and be thinking, well, how good are the models? And any person with their data will be thinking, how good is the data set? And this is the problem with species distribution models, or has been, in that there are about 20 species distribution models that are currently used, and they are highly sensitive to the algorithms that are used to create the species distribution model. In addition, when you're creating your species distribution model, you're assuming that the present day distribution of the species is in equilibrium with the climate and has no human impact upon it which as any paleoecologist in this room will know and say, that's just a very, very, um, I'm sure, you know, I don't think any of us would dare to make that assumption with our own data. But we, this is what we have, these are the tools we have, and therefore how can we use our data to improve the error predictions in these tools? <coughs> and it's through the backward prediction of these, these models. So predicting the backwards of paleoclimatic models and then looking at where the things were in terms of their fossil distribution gives it one method of testing the validity of these models. 
So we've done this. We did it for seven, seven, yeah, seven economically um, valuable European tree species. Actually, one of them was in the tree, I realised at uh, the earliest day. And we decided we would go back to a warmer interval, so we picked the medieval warmer interval. We thought there's no point going to a colder interval when these models, what we want to know is how good they are in terms of warmth, not cold. But we, so we did the medieval warm period, but to really compare how flexible the models were, we also looked at the Little Ice Age and 20th century warming. And so then we looked at the model distribution, if we ran them backwards, against what we could tell from the fossil records. So with the fossil records, we used the European pollen database to extract the records. We had to be careful, there were various caveats in there that anyone who uses it knows. But we came up with 190 sequences that had enough dating and a good enough chronology to do this with. And these were the species distributions we examined, so the fir, the beech, the oak. We also looked at olive and also at the vine. And what we did, we, used, we tested eight species distribution models. We thought we'd throw everything at it, and I expected to be standing here telling you that they were all rubbish. However, in fact, we found remarkably, all eight, we found remarkably good predictions from these species distribution models. So um, this is the Abbey's Alba. This is the predicted distribution for the 20th century uh, global warming. And this was the actual distribution from the EPD. And this is Fagus sylvatica over here, and this is, this is the, the, the fossil distribution. So I think it, most people, would, I hope, would agree that I think these are pretty good. Although many people then say to me, well, what's the white gap in there? The white gap in there is actually Hungary, and the EPD is missing Hungarian pollen data, and I have to hold my hand up here and say it's my diagrams that aren't in there. So it's a note to myself to get those in. So what we found from this was there's high model performance statistics, so we can be confident in those models that when you're predicting the future, that they really have got uh, not that much, not too much error. There was a tendency to a decrease in the model performance for those that have a very, very strong anthropogenic signature on them, for example, the olive and the vine. Um, but also they demonstrate the individual characteristics of species. So we look, this is spruce, for example, and if we look at the southern margin range, you'll see, you can really start to see quite a lot of shifting of this range in relationship to its warming and cooling and then the warming again. So this is the last example, or the two more cases that I want to give you, and it really comes back to the points made at the beginning about how do we determine sustainability or where the sustainable populations are located. So which landscapes can provide um, ever the most persistent ecosystem services despite climatic perturbations? So if we take as our baseline that climatic perturbation is going to be happening, which landscapes are best for supporting a biodiverse ecosystem? And the second one is which factors lead to persistence of or loss of ecosystem services? So first of all, I want to look at sea level rise. I think that's an important one we've heard some really excellent, I've heard some really excellent papers on storm surge and sea level rise. And what we wanted to do is look at, when you look at these really biodiverse coastal environments that you know are going to be under the threat of storm surge and sea level rise over the next 50 to 100 years, which ones will still maintain their biodiversity? And how much biodiversity will we lose overall? So this was a project that was carried out in the lab, and we were working on Madagascar, which any of you know the sort of biodiversity hotspot language, they're the hottest of biodiversity hotspots. It's this southeastern coastal margin here, it's the littoral forest of Madagascar. And so I had a, a PhD student who was collecting, she collected five core sedimentary sequences down this southern margin. So what does this margin look like? Well, along this margin, this southern margin, you've got two vegetation types. You've got this most biodiverse littoral forest, and you've also got this very, very scrubby Erica matrix. It's often called uh, Erica Heathland or, or matrix. It's thought that this is caused by human impact and that this is uh, the naturally occurring vegetation. So this effectively is thought to be a degraded landscape. And you're, you're on some way of saying that in one minute. Because what we also know is this landscape has undergone levels of sea level change. These people are sitting on fossil coral. Coral's been dated, and basically it's gone from, I think we've even got it in colour here, 
We've gone from 6,000 to 3,000 is present, then one and a half meters higher, then approximately two meters higher, and then back to present level. So you've had these storm surges occurring across this landscape, across these forest types over the last uh, five to 6,000 years. So I'm going to show you two of the pollen diagrams. I want to focus on the top one first of the former. First we'll explain the colours. So this goes back to around 3,000 years, the sequence here. And this dark green here is the littoral forest. So if you remember the biodiverse patch, the photo I showed you. This yellow here is the heathland. It's the scrubland. Now what we have in here, these blocks in here, I haven't come out very well, but you'll see there's one block there, one block there, one block there. These are, area, these are intervals of climatic perturbation that we know from other proxies. It was storm surges and aridity. And you see those, those blocks are in, you can see them very clearly in both, both pollen diagrams. So what we have here, we have nice littoral forest, beautifully carrying on being developed, and then we have a threshold event. Within 50 years, you've switched to Heathland. And you basically maintain Heathland on this landscape to the present day. It is now Heathland. And it was this, this climatic perturbation, it switched the whole forest over. If we look at site number two, so these are five kilometres apart. This is site number two. First of all, you don't get a switch with the first climatic perturbation. It's resilient to that storm surge. You've got plenty of evidence of the storm surge occurring, but nothing happens. But then it does switch over at the second perturbation, but then it's recovering. So this is a more resilient patch of landscape, of littoral forest, than, than this one here. And why is that? Well, we've done a lot of work on this, and it, it, it seems to be to do with the local soils. The soils provide a certain amount of resilience to the vegetation upon them and enable competition within that landscape. That's a whole other talk. But I think just to give you an example of being able to determine spatial patterns of resilience from using your fossil records. So that's one site, but you can't clearly go doing that um, in great detail at every site you're interested in. I think there's lots of potential using satellite imagery, which we're now working on looking at 12 year sequences, but I want to give you one last example, and that's looking at these recovery rates of tropical forests, because that's another way of looking at persistence or resilience of an ecosystem. How quickly does a forest recover <coughs> if it is disturbed? Now, this is the this is the, most carbon traders. This is the favourite photo for them because clearly they'll buy up and they are buying up degraded tropical peat forests in particular on the understanding or their understanding that within 30 years they'll have trees back and therefore they'll be putting all their money into their pension funds. I wanted to challenge that or at least try and understand how long does it take to get from that back to this because that is an, in a sense an indication of resilience of a system. So Lydia Cole, um, a colleague in the department, she went back to look at tropical pollen diagrams, to look at disturbance events in the diagrams, and to look at how quickly the arboreal pollen reached back to the previous levels, i.e. pre-disturbance. So we've looked at 40, these are the sites, 40 well-dated paleoecological sequences, um, spanning the last 10,000 years. Some of them have like eight disturbance events in them, others only have one or two but 140 disturbance events across three continents. And she basically had in here, you've got your independent variables, your disturbance type as, as depicted either from the proxies and or in the literature, your geographical attributes where the site is located and the percentage of forest decline, and then the response variables that were measured from the diagram. So things like the forest recovery, um, maximum pre-disturbance, minimum of disturbance, maximum recovery, time, time period of decline, and time period of recovery. Are, uh, these are the details, but just to show you that this, these are the sorts of measurements we used. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we found that I think the carbon traders are going to be un quite unhappy with this. Because actually your average time of years taken for 100% recovery, i.e. to get back to your arboreal pollen values you had pre-disturbance, was normally over 100 years. Very, very few sites recovered very quickly. The second thing we found, which was really surprising, and I kept asking Lydia to go back and throw more statistics at it to try and get rid of it, was the following. So these are locations. So this here is um, Asia, Africa, Central America, and South America. 
and these are recovery rates. And what you can see in here is that sites in Central America, for whatever reason, recover much quicker. In contrast, sites in South America, even though they've got much wider error bar in there, have the slowest recovery rates of tropical forests. We don't know why. Um, I think this is something to throw back to the archaeologists, actually. But it's, it's a, I think there's some very interesting uh, dynamics in there. Does the type of disturbance event affect the time it recovers? So this here, this is, this is forest clearance using burning. And these are natural disturbances, hurricanes in here. And again, although the error was incredibly wide on that one, it still very clearly shows that forest clearance through burning results in um, slower recovery rates than forest clearance through actually all the other, all the other things we measured in there. So, let me just summarize this talk then. I think, and I hope I've demonstrated that paleo records do offer this vast potential, I've certainly seen it over the last three days as well, in addressing those knowledge gaps that are being flagged up by ITVES, the international panel, for understanding ecosystem service provision in both time and space. But I would also argue that with very, with a few exceptions, and I think the, except, the, the water community have probably got onto this, have, are more into this than we are, we pay our quotas are. With very few exceptions, this potential is yet to be realized by the international community, and it has certainly been largely ignored by all other communities outside of the paleo. What we, th I think, for me, if I were going to say what the future is, I think we also we have to start to reframe the way that we put our data. We need to start to frame it in some of these other international frameworks, in the same way that paleo data is now widely used and accepted within IPCC. We should be looking to also do the same within the uh, within IPBES. But this is a real bone of uh, contention with me. We also have to consider what is the most appropriate temporal and spatial scale. It's great to model something at 100 kilometers grid square, but that's not much use if you're trying to look at landscape changes, for example, crop <coughs> movements, where 100 kilometers basically covers 20 farms in the area you're interested in. And the same is also true of the temple scale. I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone in this one. I like to have my complete Holocene sequence across a bit of late glacial. But if actually the bit that's most relevant is looking at the really critical time when you've got sea level rise, or looking at the rapid rates of change over an interval of rapid climate change, then that we should be focusing on all our efforts on those and not trying to get the complete beautiful sequence. And so my final point really is, and this is, it's a point I personally feel, that the pages and the wider paleo community really need to be involved in it from the outset, and that really is starting now. So thank you.